Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the SWAS College Football Week 12 already. Um, not the most loaded Saturday, but there's some action here. Um, I think I'm going to go through about 14 or 15 games. Let's get it started. Welcome to the SWAS. The SWAS. SWAS. Get the sewers. We'll start in the ACC. We got number 10 Louisville on the road to play Miami here. Miami catching one and a half points. This line's been bouncing around. It was Miami plus one. Then it was a pick em. Uh Now it's Miami plus one again with some one and a halfs out there. Uh, total is sitting at 46 and a half. Action's pretty split in this one. It's kind of starting to shape up as a pros versus public setup. A uh, public slightly leaning towards Louisville. Sharp action definitely in on Miami. So let's take a look at this matchup and we'll start with Jack Plummer on the road. Be careful with this guy on the road. I learned the hard way. Uh, he's only played two true road games this entire season because of the neutral site games at NC State and at Pittsburgh. Louisville didn't cover the number in either of those games and Jack Plummer was bad. Two touchdowns, four picks, just a 118.8 passer rating. And this matchup is not great for Louisville. This is an offense that wants to run the ball. A 55.97% run frequency on the season. That's 30th most in the FBS. This, this offense wants to run the ball first. We can make fun of this Miami team up and down. I mean, there's so many holes. There's so many mistakes. But one area you can't criticize Miami is defending the run. I mean, they've got, they've got one of the best defensive fronts in the country. They're third in effective rush, 11th in rushing yards per game allowed, and 6th in yards per carry allowed. The way to beat this Miami Hurricanes defense is to throw the ball on them. Uh, they're all the way back at 44th in effective pass, 73rd in passing yards per game allowed. This Canes pass defense is definitely a little suspect. We just saw it last week. Miami went on the road into Doe Campbell, was able to hold the Knolls rushing attack down, forced Jordan Travis to beat him through the air, and it almost worked. They played him down to the wire, uh, even had a second half lead in the game covered the number but on the other side of the ball it's tough to make a case for Miami's offense in this spot uh the Louisville defense has just been an absolute problem this entire season look at the last six opponents trying to run the ball in Louisville I mean Virginia was the only team of the last six that was even able to average three yards per carry against this defense. And the Miami quarterback situation is just a nightmare. I mean, I guess Tyler Van Dyke's back and is going to get the start because that freshman that they replaced him with, he got hurt in his first official start. I think it was his first official start. Uh, so it looks like Tyler Van Dyke's back. Don't have a ton of faith in him throwing the ball for good reason. Uh, so I guess your saving grace would be in the Miami rushing attack, getting it going. Let's give them some credit. They were able to run the ball well on Clemson, 5.6 yards per carry. I mean, this Louisville run defense is good, but if you can run the ball on Clemson, it's not crazy to think you can get the run game going here. Overall, it just depends on how you think this Miami team is going to come out. I mean, it seems like they only show up for the big games. At home against number 10 ranked Louisville, last home game of the season for the Canes. I mean, maybe this is considered a big game and they show up. Uh, so I'm leaning Miami. Uh, I'm actually probably going to bet the under. Uh, I haven't bet this one yet, haven't made a final decision, but I'm leaning Miami and under. I'll let you know for sure uh, the final decision on the live show, 10.30 a.m. Saturday, next game. Coastal Carolina at Army. Uh, Army is now catching three and a half points at home. That number's down from five and a half, so this line's been on the move. Total sitting at 43. Public is all over Army here. This number's been bet down from five and a half all the way down to three and a half. Uh, still a couple fours out there, so if you like Army, you could still get a four. I'd still see a four and a half on points bet as well. Straight up, I don't trust this Coastal Carolina team without Grayson McCall at quarterback. It looks like he's done for the year. I know they've been able to sneak a couple wins without him recently against Old Dominion and Texas State, and I know Army's been struggling, but Army's last game in almost a full month until they played Navy at home. I mean, I think they win this one outright, so I'm going to take the points. I'm grabbing that four and a half at points bet, so I know it's a public dog. It's been bet down from six. I probably lost some value there, but I'm still rolling with the Black Knights. Give me Army plus four and a half next game. Rice on the road at Charlotte. Charlotte catching two and a half points at home. That number's up from one. Uh, total sitting at 47 and a half. Public seems to be pretty split even on this one with the sharp action all over Rice. Uh, line's been bet up from one to one and a half to two. We're now at two and a half. Still haven't seen any threes out there though. I'm not going to go deep into this game. I know no one wants to hear about Rice for Charlotte. The reason I included this, if JT Daniels is going to play and you can get Rice at under three, take it. I mean, I would imagine if it's announced that he's going to play, this line immediately jumps up over three. You would assume... Uh, he didn't play last week. I can't find any information on it, but if JT Daniels is going to play and you can get Rice at under three, bet it. 
next game. Next up, let's talk Pac-12. Utah on the road at Arizona here. Arizona is now laying one point. This is up from a pick -em. Uh, total sitting at 45 so action definitely coming in on arizona in this one tickets leaning towards arizona sharp action also slightly leaning towards arizona uh, like i said this line's been bet up it was at a pick it's now at arizona minus one utah's absolutely owned this matchup six straight wins against arizona in fact arizona hasn't even come within one score of utah since 2017 um but i think we can all agree that this year's arizona team is a bit different than years past offensively we know this utah team needs to run the football uh barnes has gotten better recently but this is still not a passing offense we trust uh, especially on the road just 89th in effective pass 116th in passing yards per game and 83rd in yards per pass attempt if you take a closer look at utah's passing numbers though you can see that barnes was able to get the passing in going a little when he saw some weaker defensive competition i uh, threw for 235 yards on usc who's 72nd in effective pass 267 yards on washington who's 57th in effective pass and arizona's defense this year has been excellent against the run not quite as good against the pass i mean we saw what shador sanders and the colorado offense was able to do to him uh 21st in effective rush arizona is but they're all the way back at 59th in effective pass so utah was able to throw the ball on washington who's sitting at 57th arizona's 59th i mean maybe the pass game's gonna be there a bit for utah and the utes are gonna need it to be because arizona like i said they've been solid defending the run this year they're 14th in the fbs in rushing yards per game allowed 30th in yards per carry allowed i mean against a utah offense that heavily relies on the run game a good matchup for the arizona defense for me the real question in this game comes on the other side of the football though uh can we trust fafita to move the ball on this utah defense and i think he might be able to to be honest we've seen this kid have some big games against good defenses he absolutely carved up ucla who's got a solid defense this season 300 yards three touchdowns and a 181 passer rating against ucla he also had a big game throwing the ball in oregon state 275 yards and three touchdowns on the beavers we know how good that defense is too i mean this kid's been good utah's defense is obviously excellent against the pass 14th in effective pass on the season uh, but we've seen this defense give up big plays through the air specifically in their road games michael Penix had a big game throwing the ball in utah caleb williams played well against utah even dju had an efficient day throwing the ball in utah now fafita definitely doesn't have the experience of the three guys i just named but he's really going to need to step up here because utah's run defense is elite as we know and the arizona rushing attack has been great Against bad defenses, though, they were really struggling to run the ball in Oregon State and even UCLA a little bit. You know what? Arizona won both those games anyway, which is why I'm taking Arizona in this one. This is super square. I think most pros are on Utah in this one. Uh, so if you want to take the sharp side, take the huge. But I personally believe in this Arizona team. I think Jed Fish gets it done. I'm siding with the public. Give me Arizona minus one next game. Let's talk some Big 12. Cincinnati's on the road in Morgantown. Uh, West Virginia is laying six and a half points at home here. Total is sitting at 54 and a half. Public is all over West Virginia in this one. Pretty heavy. Uh, line hasn't moved at all though in fact i'm still seeing even minus 110s on these six and a halves uh so as i'm recording this this the six and a half isn't even being taxed yet definitely seems like a sketchy line here i completely understand where the public's coming from i mean cincinnati cannot throw the ball emory jones is their quarterback they're completely relying on the run and that plays directly into what west virginia does they run the ball and they stop the run you got a west virginia team coming off a blowout loss in norman to oklahoma back home for their final home game of the season they should win this game comfortably problem is like i said it's crazy public and the line hasn't moved at all this line stinks man this is pretty terrifying uh so i'll say west virginia minus six and a half and i probably will end up betting it but feels a little bit scary next game time for the biggest game of the week well yeah this is probably the biggest game of the week georgia on the road in knoxville to play the vols tennessee catching 10 and a half points at home that number's been bet up from eight and a half total sitting at 59 and a half action is all over georgia in this one tickets on georgia handle on georgia everyone's taking the dogs in this one uh like i said numbers been bet up it was at eight and a half it's now sitting at ten and a half so obviously as we know georgia has absolutely dominated the head-to-head -head matchup here six straight wins against the vols uh if you take a closer look at the numbers i guess tennessee is starting to bring the uh bring the score a little closer 27 13 last year on the road in athens but this one at home in knoxville where tennessee always plays much better so we know this georgia team by now uh this passing attack is elite 
Carson Beck hasn't even seemed to miss a beat throwing the ball since Brock Bowers went down. In fact, the offense almost looked better at times. <laughs> uh, their third and effective pass, eighth in passing yards per game, 14th in yards per pass attempt. Georgia coming off a dominating win over Ole Miss. Carson Beck was great in the game, 311 yards, 12.2 yards per attempt, 194 passer rating. Um, but that was against Ole Miss, a defense that's much better against the run. And also, more importantly, that game was at home in Athens. On the road in Knoxville may be a bit of a different story. It's definitely a tougher place to go and score points. Uh, but Tennessee's defense is similar to Ole Miss in a sense that they've been vulnerable to the pass. Just 43rd in effective pass, 49th in pass yards per game allowed, 44th in yards per pass attempt allowed. We saw what Brady Cook did to this Tennessee defense last week, and I had Tennessee minus two and a half pretty heavy. It was one of my top bets. Brady Cook went absolutely off. 75% completions, 275 yards, 11.5 yards per pass attempt, a 177 passer rating. Uh, he also made some big plays with his legs as well. A couple big third downs he converted with his legs. Uh, Tennessee had no answer for this guy, but again, that was on the road in Mizzou. Now they're back home in Knoxville. Tennessee is a perfect 6-0 at home this year, allowing just 12.7 points per game. So offenses have really struggled here. Now, have they played Georgia? Of course not. But they held Texas A&M to just 13 points in there. They held Spencer Rattler in South Carolina to just 333 yards and 20 points. Tennessee's defense has been a problem at home. To me, this game comes down to this matchup right here. The Georgia run game against the Tennessee defensive front. Uh, last week, Georgia ran the ball all over Ole Miss. 300 yards on the ground on 8.6 yards for a carry. Five rushing touchdowns. Uh, if they come out and run the ball like this again, they will win comfortably and cover this number. But like I said, Tennessee's got a great run defense, and I'm putting my faith in it. I'm trusting the Vols defense at home here. Tennessee in their final home game of the year. Definitely been a bit of a disappointing season for Tennessee, but coming off the ugliest loss of their season, this is their Super Bowl. I can see it. I think they're live. I'm going to take the points here. Not taking the money line. I mean, I think they're live. I'm not taking the money line. This won't be one of my bigger bets, but... I probably would be passing on this game if it wasn't such an awesome game to watch, but give me the points. Tennessee, plus 10 and a half next game. Real quick, let's talk some Big Ten. Illinois on the road at Iowa. Iowa is currently laying three points at home. That number's been bet down from three and a half. Total sitting at 31 and a half. Public seems pretty split even on this one. Uh, sharp action definitely seems to be on Iowa according to the data, but the line dropped from three and a half down to three, which means there's definitely some professionals out there betting Illinois. I'm not going to go into this game. Uh, the only reason I brought it up is I've already bet it. I bet Illinois plus three and a half, and there are still three and a halfs available out there. I already put it in the Discord a couple days ago. So if you want to tell me, take Illinois plus three and a half. If it's dropped down to three, it's most likely a pass. Uh, use your judgment. Next game. UCLA, USC, big Pac-12 game here. USC laying six and a half points at home. Total sitting at 65 and a half. Starting to look like a pros versus public setup in this one. Uh, public definitely leaning towards USC. Sharp action definitely on UCLA. Line has moved up from five and a half to six and a half. So the line movement seems to be going against the sharp action in this one. So last year, Caleb Williams went absolutely nuts against UCLA. Threw for 470 yards on 74% completions. Final score of that game was 48-45 USC won. Just an absolute shootout. This year will probably be a bit different though because UCLA's got themselves a defense this season. UCLA's ninth in effective pass. Ninth. This is a top 10 rated pass defense this year. They've been giving quarterbacks problems. Arizona State was held to just 176 yards passing. Before that, Shador Sanders was held to just 217 yards through the air on a 113 passer rating, his worst game of the season. Fafita on Arizona was able to throw the ball a bit on UCLA, but other than that, this pass defense has been absolutely legitimate. Caleb Williams could face some problems here. I'd be all over UCLA at plus six and a half, and I am on UCLA, spoilers. Uh, but I do have some concerns on the other side of the ball. As you can see on the chart here, the last two games, UCLA's offense scored just two touchdowns. In the two games before that, 10 touchdowns. So safe to say we've seen a drop off in offensive production from the Bruins in the last couple games. But there's a couple things to consider here. Uh, number one, look at the defenses they played. UCLA lit up Stanford and Colorado, two bad defenses, then struggled against Arizona and Arizona State, two good defenses. Now they play USC, another bad defense, so that's a positive sign. Another thing we have to mention is the quarterback situation. So Ethan Garbers won the starting job at UCLA. Not only did they play two better defenses the last two games, but Ethan Garbers got hurt in the second half of the Arizona game. So the entire Arizona State game and the second half of the Arizona game, they were playing without Garbers, their quarterback. From what I'm reading, Garbers is healthy and ready to go for this USC game. And as long as he plays, 
I'm going to be on UCLA plus six and a half. I would love to grab this at seven, but that's unlikely because it looks like the sharp money is coming in on UCLA. In fact, it's probably more likely to drop back down to six than seven. So give me UCLA plus six and a half next game. Let's talk some ACC North Carolina on the road in Death Valley to play Clemson. Clemson laying a full seven here at home. Total sitting at 58 and a half. Another pros versus public setup here. Uh, public is leaning towards Clemson. Sharp action is on North Carolina. Most books have it at seven, but there are some juice six and a halfs out there. So if you like Clemson, you can still get a minus six and a half. All right, so this is what North Carolina needs to play in the ACC championship game. And these aren't my words. I'm reading them right off a website here. So the Tar Heels would need Louisville to lose. So they need Miami to beat Louisville. They need NC State to beat Virginia Tech. And they also need Syracuse to beat Georgia Tech. Uh, they would also need, so after this week, if all that happens, UNC then needs to beat NC State next week in Raleigh to end the regular season while Miami beats Boston College next week. The reason for that is if there's a three-way tie, North Carolina loses the tiebreaker for second place. But if it's just a two-way tie uh, with Louisville, they get in. So North Carolina, it's a little thin, but they are very much still alive uh, as far as a chance to play in the ACC championship game again. I don't know how much betting value there really is on this game. I will say that North Carolina is 4-0 against the spread in their last four as road dogs. Uh, Drake May on the road in Clemson seems like a really good opportunity to boost his stock for the NFL draft. Uh, so at seven points, I'll take it. I'll take North Carolina plus seven because Cade Klubnik clearly sucks. Uh, but to be honest, I spent about 10, 15 minutes looking at this game. I don't have a ton of interest. Uh, give me North Carolina plus seven next game. Back in the Big 12, Central Florida on the road in Lubbock. Uh, Texas Tech is laying two and a half points at home. And this number's down from three. This was at three for a lot of this week. Total sitting at 59 and a half. Action is all over Texas Tech here. Tickets are on Tech. Sharp action on Texas Tech as well. Uh, so the drop down from three to two and a half is surprising. Clearly, there's some heavy hitters out there that like Central Florida at the full three. Straight up, I'm on Texas Tech here. This is a perfect betting spot. Uh, you got Central Florida coming off a huge home win in the bounce house. Now they're going to be overvalued going on the road where they always play worse. UCF's way better at home. And you got Texas Tech coming off a questionable road performance. Just 16 points scored on a bad Kansas defense. I mean, if Jason Bean doesn't get hurt in that game, Texas Tech probably loses. And my top bet, Texas Tech plus four, probably isn't a winner. Um, now they come back home to Texas, where they're always a tough out. I knew I was betting Texas Tech in this game last Saturday. When UCF was up big on Oklahoma State, and it looked like UCF plus three was a definite winner, I already knew I was betting Texas Tech back in Lubbock. Perfect buy low, sell high spot. Um, I got in at two and a half thinking that it wouldn't be available, but you could still get two and a halfs right now. Uh, Red Raiders minus two and a half looking a bit square, but I'm sticking with it next game more big 12 action Oklahoma State on the road in Houston here Cougars catching a full seven at home Which has been bet down from seven and a half total sitting at 58 and a half So actions coming in all over Houston in this one, which is surprising uh, Like I said, this number's been bet down from seven and a half to seven We'll see if some action starts to come in on Oklahoma State now that it's at an even seven But as of right now, looks like everyone's on the Cougars. So last week, Houston was favored in the game. They were laying two and a half points to Cincinnati. They got beat at home by double digits by a bad Cincinnati team. How? Pretty much the same reason Houston's been getting beat week in and week out. I mean, they cannot defend anyone. They can't defend the pass. They can't defend the run either. Cincinnati ran the ball 48 times for 204 yards, 4.3 yards per carry. Not exactly an explosive performance, but enough to comfortably win the game on the road. If Houston couldn't stop Cincinnati's rushing attack, how exactly do they plan on stopping Ollie Gordon, one of the most talented running backs in the country, coming off his worst game in two months? He rushed for just 21 yards on 2.1 yards per carry last week against UCF. In the six games before that, 186 yards per game on 7.2 yards per carry and 11 touchdowns. Keep in mind, not only is Oklahoma State coming off a bad loss, but they need this game badly. They have the tiebreaker over Oklahoma. If they win the next two games, they're playing in the Big 12 championship game. So I just don't see Oklahoma State coming out flat here. I got in at six and a half. I mean, it's still at six and a half in FanDuel. I'd still play it at seven. Um, I'm on the Cowboys here. I'm on the Pokes. Oklahoma State minus six and a half or seven, depending on what your sports book. Next game. More Big 12 action. Kansas State on the road at Kansas. This number is now up to Kansas plus nine and a half, which is up from seven. Whether that's a result of the action coming in or the injury news for Kansas at quarterback, we'll see. Um, but like I said, Kansas plus nine and a half, total sitting at 57 and a half. Looks like we got another pros versus public setup here. Public definitely coming in on Kansas. Sharp Axon definitely coming in on Kansas State. The line's been moving. 
from seven all the way to nine and a half, like I said. Look, if Jason Bean plays in this game, I'm down to take the public dog here and take the nine and a half with Kansas. The line movement makes me think he's probably not going to play. And I got to look at that third string quarterback for Kansas, not trying to put my money on him. So um, look, Kansas State's defense is much better at home. I'm down to fade the Kansas State defense on the road. So Jason Bean plays. I will play Kansas. If not, this is probably just a pass for me. Next game, Washington on the road in Corvallis. This is the other huge game with Georgia, Tennessee. Uh, we got a Pac-12 showdown here. Oregon State Lane, two and a half. This number's been bet up from one. Total sitting at 63. It was looking like Washington was going to be the public side early, but the action's been coming in on Oregon State all week. Number's been bet from one up to two and a half. But to be honest, I'm looking at it. These lines are everywhere. I mean... Uh, DraftKings one and a half, FanDuel one and a half, Caesars one, MGM's got it at two, points bet two and a half. So looks like the sports books are really in disagreement here. You can get this number anywhere from one to two and a half, depending on your sports book. So I don't exactly need to do a deep dive on the Washington offense. I'm sure anyone who's watching this is a college football fan and know what they're about. Uh, perhaps the most explosive passing attack in the FBS, first an effective pass. Not much of a run game, uh, but Michael Penix and those receiving weapons have been enough to carry this team to 10 and 0. Now, the Oregon State defense is good as hell, and trying to score points on the road in Corvallis is historically very difficult, but the Beavers have really struggled to defend the pass so far this season. Just 56th in effective pass, 81st in passing yards per game, and 50th in yards per pass attempt allowed. We just saw Fafita, that kid from Arizona, cook this Oregon State secondary a few weeks back, and I should know. I bet Oregon State minus three pretty heavy in that game, took a hard block. Loss. Uh, he had 78% completions, 275 yards, three touchdowns, a 175 passer rating. But we got to mention that was on the road in Arizona, not in Corvallis. In fact, we don't know how a good quarterback would perform on the road in Corvallis yet this year because every single Oregon State game at home has been against a team that doesn't pose much of a passing threat. I think it's unrealistic to expect Michael Penix to get shut down, uh, so I'm sure we can count on Washington to move the ball up and down the field and score some points. Even if he doesn't do his normal thing of 400 yards and four touchdowns or whatever, the passing attack is just too good. Those receivers are just too good to be completely blanked here. To me, the bigger question comes on the other side of the ball because people aren't talking about it much, but this Oregon State Beaver offense is really good. This team can run the shit out of the ball. Beavers are ninth overall offensively according to beta rank, sixth in effective rush, 13th in effective pass. And if you take a look at Washington's schedule on the season, the only times they've played strong rushing attacks, they've struggled. Oregon should have beat them. We all know Oregon should have won that game. Utah played them tough. They covered. And both those games were at home in Washington. On the road, even in Southern Cal, USC ran the ball for 203 yards on 7.5 yards per carry. That's USC. USC's rushing attack is just decent. It's nowhere near Oregon State's. We already know what the Beavers are going to do in this game. They're going to slam the ball between the tackles, keep Michael Penix off the field as much as possible, and on their home field in Corvallis, I think it's going to work. Oddsmakers really making a statement here, making Oregon State the favorite over 10-0 Washington. Uh, and I agree. I'm going to take the Beavers. I'm going to obviously take it on one of these books where I can get a better number. Uh, so give me Oregon State minus one. I also really like the under. Uh, you can still get it at 60. I see a 63 and a half right here. Under 63 and a half on points bet. So Oregon State minus one. Under 63 and a half. Let's go Beavers. That's all the time I got. Uh, but as always, live show. We'll go through a lot more games. I think I have 17 lined up for Saturday morning. So if you're able to make it 1030 a.m., I'd love to see you in the comments. Big college football Saturday. I need a good one, man. College football has just been killing me. Can't seem to catch a break. Even on Wednesday night, when I had both sides correct, still had two bad beats. Uh, really need a good Saturday here. Uh, remember to bet responsibly, and I'll talk to you in the Discord.